Flashing forwards have the ball again. Football has its roots in the working class, but big money has reshaped the so-called people's game, a market worth over $35 billion across Europe in 2019, according to Deloitte. That tension became apparent during the fallout of the European Super League. I'm just fed up in the way football fans are uh, treated by so-called billionaires. So how did working-class entertainment become a coveted business, which remade fans into customers with billion-dollar deals? Let's go back to the beginning. The first football clubs formed in England during the 19th century between workers in the new industrial economy, who would eventually export the game abroad. Miners brought it to Spain and sailors to Argentina. By 1904, an international body to organise the sport was founded, FIFA. Football went global, but still reflected local traditions. British fans often sang, inspired by working-class songs and popular music. First of all, the great crowd lift their voices in community singing. TV audiences for the beautiful game swelled after the first games began to be broadcast in 1937. The 1990 World Cup semi-final between Italy and Argentina drew a record audience of 27.5 million in Italy. This is perhaps the turning point when competitions change to fit owners and advertisers' needs. In 1992, the English top-flight teams in the UK's Football League broke away and formed the Premier League, supported by a new lucrative TV deal. Overwhelming rejection of the Premier League's offer of 5% of television revenue. The same year, the European Cup was replaced by the Champions League, which added teams and new group games to draw larger TV audiences. A pay-per-view model and more televised games attracted bigger investors. In the beginning, club members were the owners of their teams, stadiums and training facilities. But as the business grew, the model changed. Now, only 12% of Europe's top-tier clubs directly own their stadiums. Club ownership across Europe's top divisions has swung private as foreign investment flooded in. They've took one and a half billion pounds out of our club. They've loaded the, a profitable club with debt, their own debt. They've not put a single penny in. They've took out one and a half billion out. We want our club back. Stadiums are now named for companies and players wear adverts on their shirts. Merchandising sales became an important revenue stream and ticket prices for big games soared. With this, some fans say, has been the loss of a competitive element. New deals grant the biggest clubs more money from their TV rights. With it, they can attract the best players, secure spots in the biggest games and expand their base. But a new pay-to-win investment model has also brought big debt. Now, a poor season and an early exit from big competitions can be disastrous for a team's finances. I know the supporters think, yeah, but playing more games, they get paid a lot of money. But we are already on the edge. And believe me, when all the coaches think the same, the coaches... That's where the European the Super League comes in. To secure their revenues against that risk, 12 of the most famous clubs in Europe tried to create a league format in which they couldn't be relegated. The backlash was fierce. All the European Super League is basically is uh, money. It's just generating more money and it's uh, greed, basically. For now, British fans have won a stay with the league abandoned and the UK government promising to review whether new restrictions are needed. I don't think that it is good news for, for fans. I don't think it's good news for... Uh, for football in this country and look, don't, don't forget these, these clubs are not just great global brands of course they're great uh, global brands they're also uh, clubs that have originated historically uh, from their towns from their cities from their local communities they should have a link uh, with those fans but the new business model continues to threaten fair competition at the heart of the people's game